Welcome to AUC Author Series. In this series of programs, we interview the authors in the Atlanta University Center community and introduce you to their latest published works. This program is produced by Brad Oss and Daniel Lee. Today we will be interviewing Dr. Mark Ellingson, Professor of Church History at the Interdenominational Theological Center. Dr. Ellingson will be discussing his latest work, Lectionary Preaching Workbook, Series 9, Cycle B. For the invitation, great yeah. to be back. You are you are here because you have written yet uh, another book, and we're really excited about seeing it. It's called the Lectionary Preaching Workbook Series Nine, Cycle B. Um, I'm interested if you could first just explain to us what a lectionary is. What's the definition? Well, a lectionary is a an agreement which has been established by various churches, uh, usually over long periods of time, about what. Bible verses should be read on a given Sunday. Now, it presupposes the church year, the idea that uh, in a given year, there are certain festivals always to be established. Every Christian has Christmas, for example, and Easter, but there's other festivals, too. Okay, now what do you preach on those Sundays? Many Christians, and this goes back to the earliest Christians in the first centuries, have agreed that we should have certain assigned texts that always come up again and again. So that's what a lectionary is. It's the church saying, on this given Sunday, make sure you read these three texts, one from the Old Testament, one from the Epistles, one from the Gospels. Read these texts and make sure you preach on one of them. Okay. You uh, self-describe yourself as um, unashamedly, confessionally Lutheran. So doesn't the Lutheran lectionary confession tradition different than the Catholic one? Or, or does this book help both traditions, or have you accommodated for that? Well, as a matter of fact, the, there are several lectionaries that are in use right now. The Episcopalians have their own, the Catholics have their own, and then there's what's called the Common Lectionary, which is the one that is used by virtually all Protestant denominations that make use of a lectionary. Oh. However, there's a great overlap between the Episcopal, the Catholic, and the Common Lectionary, and so therefore, Episcopalians and Catholics can also find use for this uh, book, because at least those Sundays where their texts aren't exactly like the Common Lectionary, there's another Sunday, chances are, where the text for that Sunday came up later, so you can just kind of thumb through my book and find something that will help uh, you then. Okay, okay, so this can, can cross different traditions. Oh yes, even for the non- lectionary denominations, like Baptists, okay. like some Methodists and Presbyterians, they can find use in this uh, book, too. Great. Yeah, I notice on the front of the, the, the cover that you have St. Mark here. Is that indicative of anything that's going on in the book? Well, the common lectionary has three-year cycles. Every year, for three years, there's some difference. And then in the fourth year, you go back to the first year. Mm -hmm. Now, what is featured in the Common Lectionary is one of the synoptic Gospels, that is either Matthew, Mark, or Luke, are featured. And the year for which this book is written, and by the way, remember in a lectionary series, the church year begins in December with the Advent season. Right. For the coming lectionary year that this book is devoted to, St. Mark is the featured gospel. Yeah. And that's especially neat uh, for me, uh, working at the historic uh, African-American institution, uh, like the Interdenominational Theological Center, because uh, historically, St. Mark is credited as being the evangelist of Africa. Oh, that is that's so cool that that works out that way. Um, let me ask you a little bit about the technical aspects of the book, how you've arranged it here. Uh, you've got each Sunday set out and arranged, and then you have a set of possibilities. So under Lent 3 for March 11th, you have, number one, theological aim of the sermon. sermon. Uh, two is exegesis. Three is uh, theological insights. Uh, how are you trying to help the pastor by doing this, by separating this way? Well, actually, I, what you're outlining is what I have for every single 
biblical text. Remember in electionary, there's these three texts, the Old Testament, the Epistle, and then the Gospel. But even before I get to that, I provide a theme of the day. You see, the idea in the lectionary is that the three texts selected have something in common. An awful lot of pastors have trouble identifying what that common theme is. It seems to be hidden. I give the user of this book a chance to understand what these three texts have in common. Mm -hmm. And that might just shape her or his sermon, knowing what the overall theme of the day is. Then what follows is an analysis of a historic prayer that also fits the theme of the day. Now, you might not want to use the exact prayer that I'm analyzing there, but maybe it just gives you some ideas in terms of what themes would be good in your prayer. Right. Then, also, in addition to the three texts I've been talking about, a psalm is always assigned by the lectionaries. A psalm which fits the other three Bible lessons. Okay. There's an analysis of the psalms. Then we get to the text. Then we get to what you're talking about. Okay. And I try to make this an easy read, an easy user for the pastor, because a busy pastor doesn't always have time to get those sermons together. That's what this book is for. Right. So the pastor is given, right at the beginning, what is the main theological theme of this text? Well, hey, that might give me, as a user, an idea for a sermon right there. Then what follows is an interpretation of the text, an exegesis using the very best historical scholarship. But as you can see from what I've written right there, it's short, it's brief, right. uh, five, six, seven bullet points, but at least then the pastor knows what that text is all about, why it was written, when it was written, and maybe that informs his or her uh, sermon. Then what follows is a theological analysis. What kind of doctrines? And there I also find some juicy quotes from some of the great theologians of the past, from the Martin Luthers, right. the Martin Luther Kings, the John Wesleys, the Karl Barts, yeah. the James Cones. You, you can get all those things in there. Right. And let's not forget Catherine of Siena and Dolores Williams. It's not just a man show. Right. Then I do something after that that I'm, I'm almost most nervous about. I'm not nervous yet. The first, the, the first thing that follows is a gimmick. Every sermon has to have a good gimmick. You've got to grab folks' attention. Right. Well, there's some suggestions. Then the part I'm most nervous about, where I give what I call sermon moves, some possible ways that a sermon could be developed. But that's the part I'd say users can forget. Uh, I want to be sure that I'm not imposing my ideas for preaching on them. But at least on the other hand, if you like the general flow that I'm suggesting, the, the, the main points then you at least have some meat on as to how to develop this sermon. Finally, for every sermon, it ends with a closing, a suggested way to end the sermon. I love a passage Martin Luther said, you know, he said good preaching involves three things, getting up, saying something worthwhile, and knowing when to sit down. <laughs> so I help people uh, know what to say when they get up, what to say in between, and uh, knowing when and what to say when they, uh, knowing when to sit down. That's good. That's good. Yeah, that's an important one that is lost on a lot of people. Um, let me ask you a question that you do address, but I can see how uh, someone might look at this, a critic might look at this and say, um, how do you account for the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit is supposed to lead you in a sermon, does this negate the work of the Holy Spirit? Well, I'm going to show off my own denominational loyalties, but I think that those loyalties are reflected in all the denominations. That is to say, the Spirit works, but the Spirit uses means. Mm. You see, we have a God who became incarnate in human flesh, who used means to get the job done in saving us. Well, I don't think God's quit in that regard. God, in sending us the Spirit, uses ordinary means. That's why preachers need to spend time in the study, getting a sermon ready. Right. And just because you spend time in the study doesn't mean that the Spirit isn't working. So that's what I would say about the use of this kind of research in preparing your sermon. You're not bound by it. When you're in that pulpit, the Spirit may just give you some good ideas, but make sure that you're not just relying on yourself. Right. Research is the best way for the Spirit to work. The, the lectionary itself, how it works, and I'm, and I'm new to it, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't necessarily follow... Um, the, the points of the, uh, the, the cultural points of, uh, of the secular world. So it uh, does Christmas over several occasions. It does Easter over and Pentecost over many. Uh, could you explain that a little and then explain how, uh, how it is that we would feel sort of disjointed being in church from what the secular calendar is doing? Well, well that's exactly it. We've uh, talked about when the 
the new year begins for the church. It begins in December, not January, like everyone else, with Advent, this season of preparing for Christmas. And you're absolutely right about the number of Sundays the church in its church year celebrates Christmas. Likewise, Easter goes on for seven Sundays. We are out of joint with the world. Now, some would say that makes users of the lectionary, users and followers of the church here, out of joint with the world. Maybe that's a blessing. Mm. Is everything that's happening in the world today good? In fact, we can get caught up in the world's materialism. We can get caught up in the world's promotion of self and selfishness precisely by worshiping in a way that gets us somewhat removed from the world we've got a critical prophetic perspective on the world mm -hmm. worshiping in this way going against the grain of the world means that worshipers are more likely to see the world for what it is mm -hmm. and all its sin all its oppression and better be able to get back in the world in order to critique it. I think that's what St. Paul says when he talks about being in but not of the world. Right. Right. The lectionary, the church here, helps Christians be people who are in the world but not of it. Uh, yeah. If you can indulge me just for a second, let me read a uh, portion here that I thought was, was uh, very poignant. When you're talking about just this very issue, you say, it's on page 10, it is a little easier, or one is more likely, to experience awe and holiness in worship when it is removed from the rhythms of daily life. And I really like that idea. Is, is that what you're speaking to right now? Um, I was talking more about the social-political aspects of okay. this uh, book, and that's another thing I want to talk about uh, yeah. in terms of resources uh, that this book provides. I was talking earlier about the socio-political payoff right. of a church year, but now you've just raised the spiritual payoff. You see, if life is a little different on Sunday morning at 11 or at 8 or 9, then I get removed from the secularism of American life. I'm a little more in touch with God. So precisely by going against the grain of the world, we're likely to see God a little more clearly. Right. Right. Yeah, That's my point that in that was, passage. Yeah, I thought that was excellent. Uh, could you, Since you brought it up, could you speak to the social and political aspects of the lectionary and what you've done here? With well, this is another aspect. For every single sermon that I provide, every single, t uh, not sermon, every single sermon suggestion I provide, every single analysis of a text, I am offering some observations, some data from surveys, from polling data, some census data, which in fact relates to the text. So someone who is inclined to preach liberation sermons, someone who wants sermons on politics, someone who wants sermons that try to connect with latest scientific discoveries on virtually every text that is assigned in the coming lectionary year, I'm giving you some data for you to use to weave into your sermons to help people to see the scientific significance of this text, to help them see the political and right. psychological significance of the text. That's a contribution that the previous uh, lectionary workbooks uh, in this series have not offered. Okay. Um, now let me ask you, I want to step just away, just a moment from this, to ask you a question. I don't want this to be controversial. And, but so we've spoken this beautiful passage about um, sort of withdrawing from the secular life and having a, a deeper vision, a more profound vision of God. And yet you still have this socio-political aspect to the lectionary where you are talking about speaking out about those things from the pulpit. It seems like there's a dichotomy there. You are saying right from the pulpit you're, get, you're causing people to think about the socio-political situation of the day and yet you're also attempting to withdraw them from it. Is it is there a tension there or not? Or 